mostly nursing home patients and osteoporosis. This is really casual, stop me anytime. Feel free to jump in. This is going to be an overview. I know this is a diverse population. This is going to be an overview. Some things are going to seem very simple, probably. Some things might be something you haven't heard, but feel free to stop me and volunteer anything you've heard in the news this week or anything like that. This is my bladder. <laughs> For um, BPH, BPH is the non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. In our diagram, here's the bladder, the urethra, so here would be the muscle wall, urine stored here, emptied through the urethra and out, and this would represent a prostate. So it envelopes the urethra. <coughs> In the newborn, the prostate weighs only a few grams, and it's during puberty that um, around the age of 20, it grows to about 20 grams. And then it kind of sustains itself until the age of 50, and it undergoes a second androgen-mediated growth period that's not very well understood. It is very common. In fact, it's, called, um, it's considered an almost universal disease, so that before the age of 40, it's uncommon, but it occurs in approximately 50% of men by the age of 60 and 90 to 95% of men by the age of 80. So if you live long enough, you are going to have at least histologic BPH. That does not always translate into symptoms, and that's one thing to keep in mind is that this may be enlarged, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have symptoms, so it's difficult to track the natural history of this disease. Currently, 5.6 million men are eligible for treatment of BPH, so that means they have symptoms. And if you consider the graying of America um, that's predicted, this is expected to jump to 12 million in just the next 25 years. Very, very common problem. In working up the disease, just real briefly, we're not going to go into the diagnosis really, but it's important to rule out other, other problems. So um, first, how would someone present? Um, if you would look on the back side of your handout, and we'll talk about specifically how to use this form later, but it lists symptoms that are very, very common. You have obstruction and irritation caused by the enlargement of the prostate. So this closes down on the urethra and it's difficult to release urine. Patients will complain that they have difficulty starting their stream. They're going to have to strain with their stomach muscles to get enough pressure up to overcome this resistance to get a urine stream started. They may not be able to maintain their stream. It'll start and stop, start and stop, and they'll have to stand there for a long time to finish. They may finish um, what they consider to be finished, but then they have a late discharge of urine, either because there's some urine stuck here in the urethra, or the muscle surrounding the bladder just couldn't maintain that steady stream. You can imagine how, um, what a quality of life disease this is. If you have, um, if you're having to wear Depends, or um, having to go to the bathroom every couple of hours because you can't empty, you can't get enough pressure up to empty this. So they'll say, I have to go to the bathroom every night, I mean, every two hours, every three hours. Or when they lay down, that urine's going to kind of redistribute. They're going to have to get up and go to the bathroom. It's waking them up all night long. They're going to their doctor, I can't sleep at night. They get on sleep medications. I mean, you can see the, the problems this, that they could, um, this could cause. So very... Um, it's, it's a pretty disabling disease. Other things you have to think of, since these are such common um, complaints, is it, a, is it a urinary tract infection um, that's causing irritation, burning when they urinate? Is it prostate cancer? Um, just so that you know, there's other things that can mimic or overlap in symptoms. Um, it, as part of the workup, you're, you're going to look for those other things. You're going to um, look for a urinary tract infection. You're going to take a very good history from, from the patient. One thing that I want to leave you with, since I don't think a lot of us are going to be diagnosing BPH, but it's very, very important to do a very good symptom assessment of the patient. And this is not usually done. There's clinical practice guidelines for BPH. Are you all 
familiar with clinical practice guidelines, um, published by the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, and they consider this assessing symptoms to be the most important part of their recommendations. Not the treatment, not the workup, it's the most important part because we're not treating the size of their prostate because we said that it doesn't correlate. It doesn't, the, the patient is not going to care. Mr. Jones isn't going to care when you say, we've, we've shrunk your prostate. Um, or your flow's, you know, two centimeters per second stronger than it was yesterday. He's only going to care that he doesn't have to get up at night, that um, he, it doesn't burn when he urinates. You know, he cares about the symptoms. And so we rely very heavily on a validated symptom um, scale to decide how to diagnose this patient, how to treat them, and then how to follow up on that treatment. So in giving this test, it's seven very easy questions, and it asks about symptoms over the last month. It's been validated in both English and Spanish, and at the VA in San Antonio, we um, rely on the Spanish version um, quite frequently because it's just easier for some of our patients to understand that. And it asks them to rank the severity of their symptoms over a month and gives you a score. Based on that score, you can arbitrarily stratify your patient to have mild, moderate, or severe disease. And those scores are listed on your handout. If someone scores 0 to 7, they have mild disease. Moderate would be 8 to 19, and severe is a score of 20 to 35. So how is this useful to us in deciding how to treat the patient? If someone scores mild, it's usually recommended that they go for, um, that the treatment strategy selected for them is watchful waiting. That means that they don't active, they go, don't get any active intervention, but we can still help them out, give them a few tips. We can have them avoid medications that might exacerbate this problem. And to understand how medications would work, it's, it's um, good to kind of review how, how the function of the bladder works. There's beta receptors at the top of the bladder. There's alpha receptors at the bladder neck, the prostate capsule, these are my little alphas, and um, in the proximal part of the urethra. And there's also um, receptors for acetylcholine. On the, this is a detrusor muscle, so on the smooth muscle of the bladder. So this is how it's innervated in the nervous system. So to urinate, actually to store urine, epinephrine <coughs> um, gives a tonic stimulation to this beta receptor. So that means as we're sitting here passively storing urine, our beta receptor on our bladder, the detrusor muscle, is receiving signals that maintain a relaxation of the bladder. At the same time, this alpha receptor is receiving stimulation to maintain contraction right here. So it means without doing anything, we can sit here and store our bladder and have no problem with continence. When you want to urinate, you receive cholinergic stimulation to this receptor, and it causes a contraction of the bladder so that, um, to, to push urine out through the urethra. So if you think about an anticholinergic medication, and what are those? How common are those? Benadryl? All your over-the-counter antihistamines, a lot of your antidepressants, commonly used drugs in the elderly, are going to block this so that, they, so that they're losing the stimulus to contract the urine. A decongestant is an alpha agonist. It's going to stimulate this to contract. Again, these drugs are helping to um, prevent urination or exacerbating a problem of BPH. So it's good to tell your patients to not use those or if they have, you know, select an antidepressant that maybe doesn't have those properties, to select a sleeping agent that doesn't have those properties, or to recommend that they not use them every night. Okay, use them, but try to only use a couple a month on those nights you really, really need them. Um, and the, the other very simple thing you can tell your patient is limit fluid in the evening. If you're having to get up and go to the bathroom all night, don't, don't drink anything after dinner. Real simple things like that. And always reassure them that if your problems worsen, we're going to readdress them. But for right now, this is probably, since your symptoms aren't really bugging you, this is probably the best way to handle it. 
If someone has moderate to severe disease, they have three alternatives for treatment. One, they can still pick watchful waiting. They say, I don't want any more medications, I have too many. And they say, I've lived a good, healthy, long, long life and I don't want surgery. Um, so watchful waiting is an option for these people. Surgery is an option. And there's people who specifically should be selected for surgery, and that's people who are have, having complications because of this. They're having um, urinary tract infections over and over. They have to have a catheter in place because they can't seem to um, pee without a catheter in place. They're having blood in their urine. There's other, there's reasons to immediately um, select a patient out for surgery. But that leaves us with millions of people who are drug candidates, candidate for a medical therapy. And there's two options. The ACPAR clinical practice guidelines give you two. One is finasteride, and, um, and the other is a group, or Proscar, is that a familiar drug? And the other is alpha blockers. What finasteride does, um, in the prostate, um, you have an the, the male has androgens, and out in the serum, testosterone is the major androgen for the male. And in the prostate, testosterone crosses over um, and gets converted to dihydrotestosterone inside the prostate. And this is the major androgen inside the prostate, and it's this androgen that causes the enlargement of the bladder. Stop me any time if, um, if I'm going too fast. What finasteride does very simply is it blocks the enzyme that, that causes that conversion. And since testosterone doesn't have the binding capacity that dihydrotestosterone has in the prostate, it, um, you don't get the same enlargement of the bladder. So that makes sense. And alpha blockers then would make sense. You're blocking this contraction both in the at the urethra neck here and inside the um, prostate and prostate capsule. So that kind of makes sense too. And up until very, very recently, the guidelines said pick one. And if you look at number three at finasteride, um, look at the number C, the sexual side effects. I mean, if you have two options, you try to look at other ways to, p to pick out which drug you'd want to use. And almost the only side effect that you'll routinely hear from um, patients taking finasteride is that they have um, sexual dysfunction. Versus an alpha blocker is also used in other patients without BPH for hypertension. So in those patients, you hear, um, I get lightheaded, I get dizzy. Or um, because it's a blocker, uh, um, if you think if an, a decongestant is an alpha agonist, now you're giving someone an alpha blocker, they can get nasal um, congestion. So you, you kind of have to weigh those two. Um, so up until now, you could pick whichever one you wanted. Finasteride was a little more expensive, but um, people thought it had less side effects, so um, it, it was used a lot. Until this year, the VA cooperative trial was um, just published, and it said that finasteride was no better than placebo. Um, and that using the two together, because people were using one and it didn't work, so they add the other one on, they said using the two together doesn't help any more than just using the alpha blocker alone. So finasteride has is, is virtually been eliminated in the treatment of BPH overnight. It's true that it does shrink the prostate, and there is some men with very enlarged prostates that it might be effective in, but even in those patients, alpha blockers are more effective and much less expensive. So for most patients, alpha blockers are the way to go now. Um, uh, we dose them at night. There's about four alpha blockers on the market right now. Um, they all work about the same as far as efficacy goes. They're dose responsive so that by increasing the dose, you're increasing the efficacy, but you're also increasing the side effects. So um, we give them at night. So if someone gets dizzy, that there's, you know, the horizontal, they're not going to notice, and hopefully it won't be as bad during the day. And we start at a very low dose, and you use this to reassess them before increasing the dose. So if you start someone off um, on terazosin, which is what we have at the VA. We start them off at one or two milligrams, and before we increase the dose, we recheck it and see if, if they're okay. Um, if not, then we'll increase the dose again. 
Okay. The down, quick and dirty of BPH. Any questions? Um, very interesting. Um, Proscar Finasteride, the company's reformulated it and they're um, now remarketing it to treat male pattern baldness. It was just out in the Wall Street Journal this month. The, the enzyme that's in the prostate that does this conversion is also present in the skin and scalp. And so that um, some men apparently, I haven't actually ever had a patient tell me this, were um, <coughs> experiencing hair growth with Proscar. And so they're trying to recapture a market on, on a dying drug. So we'll see if it gets FDA approved. Okay. Second uh, topic is behavioral manifestations of dementia. How many people work with nursing home patients? So you understand the frustration of um, having patients who are demented for any number of reasons. We're just talking about the symptoms that come out of this and the problems. Um, it can be disruptive to the staff to have a patient yelling all the time, not, um, to be disoriented, to not be able to feed themselves. It can be disruptive. Certainly when you share rooms, you have that other person who's um, suffering from someone who's yelling or can be com combative, can be dangerous to the staff. So this is a real problem in a lot of nursing homes. I've separated symptoms out into um, psychotic and non-psychotic. Non so a psychotic symptom is what you traditionally think of as hallucinations and delusions. Um, you're stealing my money, I know you, you're, um, the problems that um, demented patients have. And then non-psychotic behaviors, but still problem behaviors. So they're agitated, inappropriately um, verbal, they're in, um, wondering. So this is other symptoms that aren't thought of as psychotic, but are still um, confused symptoms. It was in the late 80s that um, big public awareness of antipsychotic use in nursing homes came into being, and studies said that 40 to 50 percent of patients in nursing homes were receiving antipsychotics. And so the public had this big picture of nursing homes drugging up their patients so they could put more patients in and get more money and be, they'd be easy to take care of because no one's watching out for the nursing home patients. So in 1987, the Omnibus, Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, or OBRA, was passed to monitor the use and regulate the use of antipsychotics. It was in 1990 that this actually went into effect with very strict guidelines. Basically what they said is that there's only three reasons you can use an antipsychotic. The patient's hurting themselves, the patient's um, behaviors are interrupting the care of someone else, or it's a direct physical threat to the staff and what the staff needs to do. That's the only reasons. They also gave you a list of reasons that were inappropriate for using antipsychotics. Wondering, yelling, screaming, pacing, being uncooperative. Um, if they don't want to eat, your dinner, eat their dinner, that's not a reason to give them an antipsychotic medication. Anxiety, depression, insomnia. If, if a patient can't sleep at night, that's not a reason to give them an antipsychotic to, to knock them out because sedation can be a side effect. They not only picked who could get them, but they also um, said if you're going to use them, you have to document why you're using it and how often this happens. And so there's um, very detailed forms that list out the behavior of this patient that's interruptive is that he um, strikes the staff. Very, very specific behavior. And you need to mark down during every shift how often that happens. And then when you start an antipsychotic, you need to show that in using the antipsychotic, that specific behavior decreased. Not only do you have to keep all those records, every six months you have to um, try to taper off. So, okay, um, Mr. Jones was combative and we gave him an antipsychotic and his use um, and his combativeness went down. But six months later, we have to try to decrease him off that dose. Maybe he doesn't need it anymore. Um, maybe he could be, um, find the same efficacy with a smaller dose and less side effects. So it mandates that every six months we try to titrate down on the dose. It may not work, we may have to go right back up, but we have to at least challenge that dose. 
1994 in JAMA, um, a study was published showing that antipsychotic use has decreased because of the OBRA Act by about, uh, by about 25 percent. So um, strict guidelines has decreased the use of antipsychotics. In dealing with a demented patient, it's important to rule out other causes. So you have someone who doesn't communicate very well and they're acting out behaviorally. Somewhat like you think of a little child yet who hasn't learned to verbalize well and you need to think about what's going on. So the patient um, won't eat, gets combative during mealtime. You have to think about everything that's going on ar um, around the patient. Is it cold in there? Is he have an eating partner that um, is disrupting him? Is the TV going on in the background? What's going on around this patient that can um, be further agitating him um, in a demented state when your perceptions are not clear anymore? You have to think about what's going on inside the patient. Um, is he sick? Do you, um, infamous, do, do you need to rule out a urinary tract infection? Is he having a flare of his arthritis? Did the weather just change and now his joints are aching him? Did he sleep on his sleep the wrong way in bed last night and his back's hurting him or he's been in his wheelchair too long and he's acting out because now his bottom hurts him? What else is going on in this patient that's making him or her act out? One of um, my favorite stories, we had someone in a nursing home, who um, an older woman, who would throw an absolute cat fight every time they um, had to take her to the shower. They just could not seem to bathe this woman. And they um, had started, and I said, it was like PRN something 30 minutes before shower time because she, she wouldn't get in the shower. And it wasn't until one of the staff took time to get to know her family that they found out that she was Jewish and that she was a previous member of a concentration camp. And that in her mind, that shower meant something very, very different than it's, it's time to get clean today. So it's, it's important to know your patients. You can't walk in on day one, see a demented patient and go, oh, this is how she is, I just, she's always gonna be this way. Always look for that slim hope that there's something else going on that we can take care of instead of medicating the problem. Non-pharmacologic management. This is really big um, in Alzheimer's patients, demented patients. Um, putting in them in an, env uh, an environment that doesn't further aggravate their dementia. To approach them very calmly. Don't run up and go, oh, Mrs. Jones, quit doing that. Um, you don't know what they're perceiving your fast actions and loud voice as. So you always approach the patient very calmly um, and talk to them in a, in a very steady voice. Touch. Touch is, um, is a difficult one because we think of touch as being very helpful, but again, you don't know the perception of the patient, and if they think, if they have some delusion going on that you're the enemy and you're trying to touch them, that can be bad. Another patient may quiet right down to just a simple pat or a nice voice, so you need to, again, um, get to know your patient and let them get to know you. Um, verbally orient the patient. So let them know where they are today, what time it is, that it's almost lunch time and we're going to be going to lunch soon to give them an idea of where they are again, what's going on, what can I expect next. And there's lots of, I'm sure you've heard of putting their pictures up on the wall, putting clocks and calendars in the room, external stimuli that help orient, orient the patient. Um, another very good one is to validate the feelings, and I think this is um, something that's kind of progressed over the last maybe decade or four decade or so. Before, if, if Mr. Jones thought he was going fishing, it was very important for us to say, "No, Mr. Jones, you're in the nursing home today. I'm sorry, you know, you're on block C of this city, and today it's 10 o'clock, and you're not fishing. You're in your wheelchair." Today, that's, that's not necessarily true. If Mr. Jones thinks he's fishing, have fun. Did you catch a fish today? How big was it? Oh, that's great. So if it's not a harmful delusion, don't treat it. Um, save your concern for someone who's having a bad time in their delusion. Remove objects in the environment that will be misinterpreted as a threat. So even a simple cord like this to a demented patient could be um, a snake or something else. Again, you need to figure out when they say there's a man in the room, are they talking about the coat rack over in the corner or are they actually seeing a man in the room? So, so that's also a good thing to investigate. And to redirect your patient. 
So if your patient's doing a destructive um, act, instead of chastising him, you shouldn't do that, don't do that again, I told you a hundred times, don't touch that. It's, Mr. Jones, come look at what I have for you over here. It just um, redirecting them to a different activity to take their attention away from the destructive behavior that they were using. On the back side of your handout is um, a list of antipsychotics um, and their side effects. Antipsychotics are neuroleptics. It's often, they're often um, called neuroleptics. Same thing. Mechanism, uh, neurotransmitter regulation, there's no difference in efficacy between these agents. The difference comes in at the side effects. It's true a patient may respond better to one than the other, but in general, there's no, um, there's no one drug that's been shown to be any better than another drug. So we do look at the side effects. When they did look at how effective these drugs were compared to just a sugar pill, they found that only 18 out of 100 actually in controlled trials improved. So these are not, they are not ma magic drugs in the patients who are even very valid candidates for them. So it's important to keep track of who is actually benefiting. Um, symptoms that do seem to respond, anxiety, excitement, emotional ability, hallucinations, and hostility seem to be the individual <coughs> symptoms that respond best to antipsychotics. And the side effects, side effects are frequent, almost a third to um, half of patients could have a side effect from an antipsychotic, and these aren't benign side effects. They're, they're stratified between high and low potency, and, and we'll look at that a little bit when we get into the chart, but anticholinergic effects are very common with antipsychotics, and you can dry mouth, um, dry eyes, urinary problems, confusion caused just from the side effects of these drugs, um, sedation, Again, you're putting someone who may be demented, frail, and elderly at risk for a fall. Um, EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, is an involuntary movement of the muscle caused by these drugs. Which is very, um, it's a very unpleasant side effect, and if you have someone on an antipsychotic, you're actually required to look for this and to document that you looked for this. Decreased seizure thres threshold, this is one we often forget. If you have someone with a history of seizures on a seizure medication, or who have uh, maybe a diabetic who's had lots of little strokes, and then you're giving them something that's gonna decrease their threshold, they may present with a new seizure or um, exacerbate an old seizure problem. Uh, tardive dyskinesia, again, another movement disorder, um, mostly in the face and the tongue. Um, and this occurs after a long time use of antipsychotics, but once again, something very important to look for. Cardiac arrhythmias, think about how many older patients we have with cardiac problems already. And orthostasis, again, you're predisposing your patient potentially to a fall. In deciding, I actually use a chart like this. Um, I keep this, this in my pocket because I think it's really helpful. It has the agent and the brand name because they're very confusing, um, even for pharmacists, and it tells you um, between low and high potency of the drug and how that translates into side effects. So that if you use Thorazine, a low potent agent, you're much more common to get sedation, hypotension, and anticholinergic effects, but you don't have to worry as much about the movement problems. The potential's still there, but the patient is not as, um, is not as likely. Compare this to Hal Haldol, where sedation's not really a problem, orthostasis, not a problem, anticholinergic side effects, not a problem, but they're much more likely to have the movement um, disorders as a side effect. So you might wanna look at your patient. Is it someone who's already confused and you don't wanna subject them to the anticholinergic effects? Then maybe Haldol or an agent like that is a better choice. So this, this is pretty useful. Okay, any questions on antipsychotics? Okay, osteoporosis. This is something often overlooked because it's often a prevention problem. Um, and it's easier to treat a symptom a patient comes in complaining of than to have to remind yourself that I need to be thinking about osteoporosis in this woman. It's very common, currently affecting 25 million American women, uh, predominantly women, but uh, 25 million Americans. 
responsible for 1.5 million fractures. This translates into hundreds of thousands of hip fractures, and the morbidity and mortality of hip fractures are, are very well known. Can cost up to um, $10 billion a year in healthcare costs, so this is a very costly disease, and once a patient has osteoporosis to the point of fracture, it can decrease their lifespan and certainly the quality of their life. Who's at risk? So who do you need to think about? Older people, immobile people, um, you're bedridden or uh, in a wheelchair. Postmenopausal women, either if they were early post, any postmenopausal, but you want to think particularly about the women who had had surgical early in their life or were an early, post, uh, early menopausal woman. Medications can actually um, increase the risk of osteoporosis by how they affect calcium or bone modeling and a convulsance. Lasix or furosemide, very, very common um, use in the elderly. Steroids, aluminum containing in acids, methotrexate, phenytoin, again, anticonvulsant. So um, medications can predispose someone to osteoporosis. Female, of course, will have less bone mass. Nutrition, did they have a poor um, calcium intake during their life? Smoking decreases estrogen levels in the body and can predispose someone to osteoporosis. Genetic makeup, and again, I kind of trace this back to bone mass. A small Asian woman um, is probably more at risk um, for, for a thin build and family history. The diagnosis of osteoporosis is actually kind of an expensive um, test that looks at bone mineral density. So it isn't something we just right now have the luxury to screen everyone on. And in fact, a lot of places don't even have the capability of measuring bone mineral density. So we try to pick out patients who are particularly at risk. And those would be women who, um, postmenopausal women, who maybe have been on a course of steroids for some reason and for an extended period, or they have <coughs> multiple risk factors, certainly if they've already had a fracture. Um, so you need to pick out maybe who should get a more expensive diagnostic test. Non-pharmacologic treatment, exercise, and it needs to be weight-bearing exercise. So I think swimming is a wonderful exercise. For a lot of patients, it's all they can do, um, but it isn't going to help with their osteoporosis. So you need to put weight on the bones. Reduce intake of caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. Again, these affect how you handle calcium in your body and can predispose to osteoporosis. Reduce the risk of falls, so you have someone who has got a decreased bone mineral density. You want to um, help remind them or maybe have them make some changes in their house that decrease the risk of falls. And calcium, kind of considered non-pharmacologic since it's over-the-counter and dietary, but certainly it's often prescribed. Um, table, the first table in your handout is the recommended daily calcium intake. So for women 25 to 65, so this, isn't, this wasn't the thin elderly woman who's postmenopausal here. Every woman after the age of 25 is recommended to have at least a gram of calcium a day because we know that you need to build up that calcium in your bone. It doesn't help as much to say, okay, now you're 65, you've gone through menopause, we want you to start calcium. That needs to start way back. Men as well. Once a woman is postmenopausal, if she is taking estrogen replacement, she can continue to take one gram of calcium a day. And, and some of that's coming from her diet, maybe all of it's coming from her diet. But if she's not taking hormone replacement um, therapy, or HRT, as I abbreviated in your handout, then it's recommended that she increase her daily intake to a gram and a half. And that's recommended for all men and women over the age of 65, a gram and a half of calcium a day. Um, calcium products are really confusing. I'm Moonlight at HEB and um, people are always coming in and saying, which kind of calcium do I get? The oyster shell or the carbonate and the sustained release looked really good on TV. Um, this table gives you the product with the brand name at, at the other end of the table and then the percent of calcium um, that's in each each tablet so that calcium carbonate, 300 milligrams of calcium carbonate is not the same as 300 milligrams of calcium gluconate. There's a big difference there. 
And if you look on the bottle in the back, it'll say 300 milligrams of calcium, but then in smaller print underneath, it'll say so many milligrams of elemental calcium. And that's what you need to look at as far as how much you're taking in. One of the only things I, I think of is that in the elderly, I'm sure Nicole talked about the acid, their ability to produce acid goes down. And so the citrate formulation is a very good choice because it doesn't require an acidic environment in the stomach to be absorbed. Other tricks is to dose it in between meals when there's more acid in the stomach instead of with meals. And also some of the foods that you take in actually decrease the absorption of calcium, so it is good to dose it in between meals. But some patients, you're just happy that they can, t they can hook it to breakfast, lunch, or dinner if, if that's their cues to take their medicine. Dietary sources, of course, milk, broccoli, turnips, cabbage, nuts, seeds. So there's lots of dietary um, ways to take in calcium. And then vitamin D. Vitamin D increases the, um, the calcium in, um, absorption in the body. And it's recommended that the daily allowance is 400 international units, or IU. Most of us, particularly living in San Antonio, get that walking out in the sun for just, I don't even think it's much more minutes a day, we, we absorb enough calcium, but it, I mean vitamin D. But if you think about the nursing home patient, or someone who doesn't get out a lot, or is having problems with their calcium, um, vitamin D is another option to um, help them out. Okay, pharmacologic interventions. Estrogen is currently considered first-line therapy. Is it an alternative for everybody? No. This, there's certainly an emotional um, kind of whole attitude surrounding hormone replacement therapy. And, and some of that is very valid. There is an increased risk. We th Actually, we're not sure if there's an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, but there certainly is epidemiologic studies that are very flawed that um, hint that maybe that's true. There is an increase of uterine cancer. And so when you're giving a patient, a woman, estrogen replacement, if she has an intact uterus, Always, always, we add progesterone all, uh, or a progestin, always. There's really no excuse now not to. And the evidence is very clear. And a woman who doesn't have a uterus doesn't need it. It's just an extra medication, and it, there's no sense present, um, preventing a cancer that can't happen. So certainly this is um, a medication that needs to be discussed with the patient. Yes, you are at risk for osteoporosis. Um, Porosis. Yes, you're postmenopausal. Yes, estrogen is a wonderful um, treatment for osteoporosis. But we need to talk about the other risks and benefits of it so that you are making an, an informed decision. It's going to decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. We know it decreases lipids um, or cholesterol. And it increases the good cholesterol in women, the HDL. So there are other bonus effects of estrogen. But we kind of talked about the risks. And for some women, any hint of a risk of breast cancer is enough um, to, to make them personally decide not to use it. What's the dose? Usually Primarin is what's available now, 0.625 a day, every day. And then you can add in the progestin either cyclically or I like to do it every day because I don't want someone to have to remember what, what couple days of month they have to take it. Is the patch as good as the pill? Um, it looks like for osteoporosis it might be that um, the patch that you can just put on and leave on for several days is as good as the pill. However, when it comes to cardiovascular benefits, that's not true. It seems that the, that the pill has to go through the liver um, for, for the heart to gain that benefit. Okay, something, um, the bisphosphonates. Um, Alendronate or Foxamax is the new bisphosphonate out, and it's currently the only one with FDA approval. It's taken 10 milligrams every day, and it's indicated it's very expensive, so this isn't considered first line for just anybody. We like to pick out people who can't take estrogen, won't take estrogen, or can't um, or aren't compliant with their estrogen, or women who have already had a fracture, or maybe have um, got tests done and we know that they have osteoporosis. It's documented by their bone mineral density content that they have osteoporosis and it's worth the cost of the Fosamax. Some things to know about this drug specifically, 
Um, it's dosed 30 minutes before meals. It's recommended that the woman take it with a full glass of water and that she remain standing for, I believe it's up to 30 minutes after the dose. The reason for that is it's been associated with um, esophageal ulceration if it gets stuck in there. So we put the woman in position that it's going to go right down to the stomach and don't have her lie down where it could stay in the esophagus. Okay. Other bisphosphonates are available, but we don't really see them, uh, see them used very often. Calcitonin inhibits bone breakdown. It's available by two mechanisms. Either it can be injected sub-Q or there's a nasal uh, a route that it can be administered. Um, so the woman either has to give herself an injection, which some women do, or it's one puff every other rotating nostrils every day. So it would be this nostril, then this no nostril the next day. And that's just to cut down irritation because she only needs one spray. Sodium fluoride is um, very interesting. Right now, all we have is immediate release sodium fluoride. And that's what we give to kids usually. Um, dentists give that to kids. And it comes in, help me out, what, what milligrams, like 0.025, point milligrams, 0.1 milligram comes in very small doses. Studies have been done with a sustained release, and in fact, the company who makes that is based in San Antonio. And the studies look good, but it hasn't, been, it hasn't received approval yet. And one of the reasons it probably hasn't is because it does help build bone, but it seems like the bone that it builds um, is not very strong bone. Um, so that women actually, in some studies, got more fractures if they were taking the fluoride. What they do to prevent this is they have them take it for a year and then take a little off time, take a holiday from it, and then restart it and then take a holiday so that during that holiday time the bone can strengthen away from the fluoride. Um, this may be a, 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 a cheap option that may be coming up soon. At the bottom at the table, I gave you a little cost comparison. I called ATB last night and they gave me a little um, a price breakdown. Um, just for your information about how much we're talking about and how that matters when we're talking about someone who is primary prevention versus secondary prevention. Someone who we think is at risk for osteoporosis, but we don't know that she has decreased bone mineral density, she's never fractured, versus someone we either have a diagnostic test that tells us or she's already fractured something and we want to prevent a second fracture. Okay, any questions? Thank you very much for your attention.